shows um, were as wanted to include uh, the local aspects. You know, there weren't no local people killed on the train, but there were plenty of local people involved oh, in, yeah. in the operation afterwards. So it's, it's, it's like eight people died, 55 were injured. It's always there, isn't it? Now, it's so, so. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing it. I was only a lad then, and then it took me, and that's when I thought, well, you know, so many people have got memories of it, and let's try and uh, and give it a place in history. And we just thought that this would uh, would help as well. Driver, yeah, from Kentish Town. Oh yes, uh, really? and, and of course he he was a driver on the steam trains before the diesels came. All oh, right, so <laughs> right, so, uh, right. Yeah. He was a super fella. Yeah. In fact, he was my age. Was he? So he'd now be seventy-six. Yeah. Is he still around? Or? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, when I say yeah. yes, indeed, I mean yeah. the last I heard, yeah. he was in full health. Yeah. yeah. See, when he was originally poor, you see there was Yes, yes, so, yes. yes. See from where we stood here, you can see the pub a lot clearer, yes, and nothing yes, at all there. Yes, yes. I'm the driver's son. Um, yes, the this son. is the engine driver's grandson. Oh, goodness. Wow. <laughs> I'm Mike Reilly, with Chucky Burrow. Yes. Who really got us up to this part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's his base. But how, but of course, when the book was written, Alan had no knowledge of it whatsoever. No idea at all. You had no knowledge of No idea of at all. Of, of the whole. Episode, you know, really? as far as I was concerned, it was history. Yeah. That that was it. Um, but who was the um, the author of the um, book that put me in touch with you? Um, the author of the book was it? You mean was it? The, it wasn't the publishers, was it? Fact and fiction. No. No. Um, oh dear, oh dear. I am getting the story. You mean um, who would it have been? Um, you got, I, I know, you, I, know he, I, I said to him, you know, will you put me in touch with Mike Riley because, yeah. oh I know, he'd been to a book conference or something and met you. And that was right. only then that he realised that this paperback had been written. James has stopped right. that. Yeah, that's fine. I procure fine. it. And he okay, said, what would you like do? to borrow it? Right. And of course he sent it to me. Yes. And then I said, my God, can I get in touch with this man? Yeah. And he said, well it's not diplomatic for me to, you know, directly get in yes. touch. But he said, you know, I will um, speak to him, you know, next time I see him. In the meantime, of yeah. course, I, my brother contacted the signalman's son yeah. in Tasmania yeah. and said, I can give you Mike Briley's telephone That's number. That's right. And that's, of course, when I contacted him. Yeah. That's right, yes. that's right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Alan Wilshire. And it's simply Mr. But retired. Yes. Um, tell me the story as you knew it, really, of your oh. father's death. Well, um, Dad took the 11.45 London to Bradford. He was the uh, locomotive that was the train engine as opposed to the pilot engine in front. And we knew, we'd lived near the rail and we always knew what time he'd be passing. Um, so that invariably we'd belt upstairs and wave to him as he passed. In the evening, around six o'clock time, we listened to steam radio and we heard that the 1145 London Bradford had crashed. And my brother and I were by ourselves having a, having a meal and realized that this was dad's train. I immediately jumped on my cycle because it was before the days everyone had telephones. I immediately jumped on my cycle and cycled to Kentish Town, which was the locomotive depot from which he came. And they didn't know anything about the accident or at that stage and I said well I assure you you know I've just listened to it on the radio and of course when they made contact with Leeds um, you know the, the picture became uh, plainer um, I immediately got on a train to Doncaster which of course was the nearest station to Wathon Dern and of course there I learnt to my horror that um, you know dad was severely burnt and of course um, you know, from there he died six o'clock the following morning. Um, but you know, basically that is the story in a nutshell of um, how we learned about it. Um, you did also mention that your father had a premonition, didn't you? Oh yes, yes. <coughs> we were, we were all sitting around at breakfast time. My mother, my my brother, and I, 
and dad started to talk about having a ghastly dream at night he said he said to my mother there was blood everywhere he said, it was absolutely appalling someone knocked at the door and the conversation dropped and it never got going again and you know i always think he had a premonition that something was going to happen i mean the railways generally speaking are in a pretty poor condition they'd been hammered to the very devil during the war very little done to them um, and Dad was always scrupulous about speed restrictions, of which there were tremendous amount. Um, and you know, it, it amazed me really that this sort of accident could have happened. But then you see, on the day, the temperature was pretty high, and of course, you know, this is this is what did it. And of course, his pilot engine. He never used to like to be behind a pilot engine because so often you couldn't see signals. Um, but of course, at the time of the um, derailment, the pilot engine jumped forward ahead, broke the couplings, and of course, Dad went down the bank with the with the rest of the train. What's it like for you coming back today to the site of the accident? <laughs> Wonderful, but very emotional. Very emotional. Wonderful is a really strange adjective to use. Why do you say that? Uh, because of the work that's put in by people uh, that I would never thought of, um, you know, they would have put in this sort of work uh, for, for such an occasion. I mean, I think it's absolutely wonderful. And um, I mean, it's history now, isn't it? it, it I mean, it's history that isn't going to be forgotten. Um, oh, I'm so delighted that, you know, I've sort of been brought up to date with it. Yeah. Great. You've been an important part of bringing them up to date with this. Absolutely. Introduce yourself first of all. Well, I'm uh, Mike Brearley. Uh, the reason I decided to write the little book was because I recall the accident. I, I was only a small boy then, but I remember it very much. And I could never understand why it never featured in uh, books about railway accidents and I thought it uh, was quite a spectacular accident and uh, I felt really that uh, we should make mention of it so uh, this is where I decided to uh, just do a little bit of uh, book writing just to um, um, remind everybody of what, what did happen but the, re the, the way Alan contacted me um, was quite remarkable really because when we um, unveiled this memorial which was on the 18th of May 2000 I then hadn't written the book and I was thinking about it but I hadn't yet put pen to paper and what happened was that as a result of the memorial and the service a copy of the South Yorkshire Times uh, was sent to a gentleman in Tasmania and this gentleman in Tasmania happened to be the train um, register boy in the signal watch at Wath. And he saw uh, uh, this and he thought, my gum, I was the first man to see the train go down the embankment. I don't know who to write to. I will write to the vicar of Wath because his picture was in the photograph in the South Yorkshire Times. So he wrote to the vicar of Wath. The vicar of Wath introduced him to, uh, introduced him to me via the letter. I then had a wonderful friendship with uh, this gentleman, uh, gathered a lot of information from him over the course of a couple of years before I then sat down and wrote the little book. Um, then quite out of the blue I received a phone call from uh, Alan um, about two or three months ago and he said I didn't know there was this little book but somebody has given it me. He says Mike I have read it 50 times. He says it has brought everything back to me. He says but I it has been a very very roundabout way. Um, I have had to contact you. I didn't know who you were, where you lived, your telephone number and he said I have had to go through the international directory inquiries in Tasmania uh, to try and find a Lambert family in Tasmania and uh, I think if you need any more of that story then uh, Alan would be able to give it you but from that uh, he was able to obtain my telephone number and that's why he's here today. Brilliant. I don't think we're going to have too much time for much more of the story but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, I'm just going to get some sound from over here. Have you got the, uh, do you know the story of the storm, Kate? Uh, this 
accident happened in 1948 and it would be nice if we could actually have a memorial. So a local sculpture, a Yorkshire sculpture was commissioned and uh, the stone is made out of uh, stone from Cadeby Quarry. And you can see it's a, it's a splendid job, but the, the name of the engine, Gilbert and Ellis Islands, and it's number. And a carefully thought out form of words at the bottom to say how the stone commemorates the people that were killed in the crash, but also the efforts that were made by significant numbers of local people in the rescue attempts. Bear in mind this happened just a few yards from Mamba's Colliery, and the Colliery Ambulance was first on the scene. Mines came out of the pit, they used pit props to hold up the wreckage while the passengers were rescued. Uh, and also the pit canteen was utilised, and so it was a real local effort uh, in, in the rescue attempts. 55 people were conveyed to Mexico Hospital just about a mile away. Uh, the first casualty arrived after only 11 minutes, which I think is quite remarkable. Um, I think the, the efforts that were made in that time and the strain that that must have put on Montague Hospital must have been quite amazing, really.